Staley Pine stand here today. This place has undergone some major changes in less than two centuries. In the first half of the 1800s, it was a large fertile prairie. Today, it's young stately pines. But in the late 1800s and until the 1930s, it was considered the largest desert east of the Mississippi River. You would know it today. Concerned citizens, tax dollars, and government-sponsored labor changed all that. We're standing in what used to be the Big Prairie Desert. And this lonely remote cemetery is where a group of women were the first to fight back against the fortunes of nature. Let's explore this area and learn the interesting story of Michigan's Big Prairie Desert. I'm Chuck. I'm Poppins. Let's go on a learning adventure. In 1849, a man named John McBride happened on to a 2,000 acre prairie in the newly surveyed land of Noego County. Ten years earlier, a hastily executed treaty with the First Nations secured the land for potential settlers. That same year, a man named Ephraim Utley led an expedition of 30 people here and he put down roots to become the first white settler of the area. Logging camps were already established around here. Surrounding the prairie were old virgin growth, white pines and towering oaks. A couple of settlers plopped down farm stands right in the middle of the prairie while most of them chose to settle around the outskirts because they wanted mostly to harvest timber. That farming side hustle of Big Prairie became pretty lucrative. In fact, farming was so good that most of the prairie farms were described as comfortable and pretentious. When they first found this prairie, there was a layer of sand and organic material six to 18 inches deep. It was well-drained soil. In fact, it didn't hold much water because under the layer of tillable land was almost pure sand. Now, anyone that knows their 1930s U.S. history about the Dust Bowl, you know that if you over farmland for a couple decades and you deplete the nutrients, then Mother Nature comes back with a vengeance. And in 1865, it all began. What the residents called the blowing. Kind of sounds like a horror movie. And for the residents on the prairie, it kind of was. And almost two years later, all the farmsteads on the prairie were abandoned. When they first found the prairie, there was a layer of organic material, six to 18 inches thick, that made for good farming. But within two years, that entire six to 18 inches of soil was blown off, leaving the sand. You can see that right now with the limited wind that blows here, that we have a small hummock started. And this is what the residents had. They had hummocks that were six to eight feet tall because that much soil had been swept away. You can see that this area still has some small hummocks. We haven't found one from back then. So imagine this started and eventually consumed hundreds of acres. So many acres, in fact, the farms went out of business and had to be reverted back to the state. By 1880, most of Section 18 of Big Prairie Township was consumed by the blow. And the land reverted back to the state of Michigan and was called asylum lands. It took me a bit of research to figure out what asylum land meant. And apparently when land reverts to the state of Michigan and they eventually sell it, the proceeds from those land sales went to the benefit of the Michigan Asylum for Educating the Deaf dumb and the blind today we don't call it that anymore we just call it the michigan school for the deaf and believe it or not the michigan school for the deaf still exists today in flint michigan in one of its original buildings so in 1880 just 20 years after the booming of the farming on this prairie the land became worthless and in the early 1900s the everett big prairie cemetery was in danger of disappearing the gate was blocked by a huge sand dune and over here on the east side a huge sand dune was accumulating that was spreading and in danger of burying the cemetery. But then a group of women called the Old Social got together to save the cemetery. They placed straw, hay, and brush to try to block the sand from burying the graves. But the graves were soon buried. So they went to the forest and they got evergreen trees and quack grass to plant to block the sand. And those trees survived and actually served pretty well at blocking the sand. So the blow continued into the 1900s and the Big Prairie Desert continued to grow. And a lady named Dorcas Hayes remembered in the 1900s when she was a child, and she remembered this in the 1960s, that her father actually got lost in the desert coming home from church because of the limited visibility 
and the size and scope of the desert. Then in 1922, the Old Social made a decisive move and they planted 40 acres of trees over here to stop the blow from blowing into the cemetery. The trees have since been harvested then, but also in 1922, a hundred years ago, they planted these trees, we think, on the west side of the cemetery to keep the sand from burying the cemetery. So we don't know for sure if these are the trees that were planted by the old social, but there's a way to know how old these trees are. So first we have to know what kind of tree it is. What tree what kind of tree is it, Poppins? It's a white pine and we know because there's five needles in each bundle. So there is a growth factor for white pine trees. And if you like and subscribe this video, I'm gonna give you the growth factor right now. I'll wait. <laughs> you guys subscribed? Did you like the video? So the growth factor is five. And by t getting the circumference of the tree, which is, I don't know, around six feet on this tree and dividing it by pi, then you can take the diameter. I think that's how the math works. You can take the diameter and then multiply it by five. And you come out to about a hundred, which is when these trees apparently were planted. So the prevailing winds come from that direction. So being here on the west side of the cemetery, it only makes sense that these are the trees that they planted to block the wind. Well, back to our story. Big Prairie wasn't an official desert as the area received plenty of rainfall, but Big Prairie eventually became a tourist attraction with picnickers traveling hundreds of miles to view the largest desert east of the Mississippi. There was even talk of further developing the area for tourists, but the residents weren't having it. Their homes and livelihoods were at stake. It isn't clear how large the dunes extended. Evidence seems to support well over a square mile of land, some estimates as high as 10 square miles. No matter, the desert kept growing into the 1920s and the 1930s. Then in 1933, the National Forest Service took over the Dust Bowl. Now it's kind of ironic, the Forest Service taking over a Dust Bowl, but they decided to create a forest. So they began planting trees. The Michigan Experimental Forest came first in 1936. Then later, an 80 acre plot was planted. In fact, the entire county was busy with people from the Work Progress Administration as men were put back to work during the Great Depression planting trees. Then in 1939 and 1940, all those planting seedlings were blown away as the blow counteracted. And then they had to replant them in 1941. As World War II started, Labor was short as everybody was involved in the war effort, but a nearby conscientious objector camp came to plant those trees. They planted trees in 1942, 1943, and then in 1946 to 1947. And by 1965, over 13 million acres of trees were planted, over 945 acres. Then in 1974, the first 75 acres were harvested for pulpwood. Today, there aren't any campgrounds. There's no memorials to the old social or infographics to explain the drama that happened here. Of course, the National Forest Service doesn't exist for our recreation and education. That's the job of the National Park Service. Here, the Forest Service helped change a desert into a forest. We say a lot about our government, mostly critical, but they're people just like you and me. They want to do good work, and this place is a result of their work. It isn't a prairie anymore, but the government didn't destroy the prairie. The citizens did. So that old social, the residents who had planted the trees along with the Forest Service, they made the best of a bad mistake. And I'm certainly glad they did. I'm Chuck. I'm Poppins. Channel's Restless Viking. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you in an adventure again. And hey, you haven't subscribed yet? Go ahead and do that.